two things uh, logistics wise that I wanted to point out to you. Let me get the screen share going so you can see what I'm looking at. Um, one is the, the stream of the class that is being recorded and shared to YouTube. As I mentioned in my email, I inadvertently captured your voices. Um, I had not intended to do that, but then in thinking about it, thought that might actually be a good thing because folks can hear the discussion and the questions if they hear the class. Um, however, um, I'm sensitive to privacy concerns or any other concerns that you might have the, about that. So if anyone has any problems with that as a plan, please let me know and we can talk about it or we can change gears. So um, just to give you a heads up, here is the course website. Can you all see this? Yes, excellent. It's blue. Um, all of my courses are different colors so that I can keep track of what, what I'm looking at. Um, since I have a HTML 1999 style tables to, to work with, uh, they're, they're simple, but they work. Um, I have posted on last Tuesday's class the video that goes with it, and I will continue to do so. So for each class, there'll be at least one video for what happened. Um, if I end up like finishing one lecture and starting a different one, I may split the video into two parts just to make it easier if, if, uh, if I'm able to do that. Um, I also uh, activated the homework portal this morning. I haven't had a chance to record the demonstration video that I was planning, but if you are curious, you can go ahead and poke around there um, to play with it. The link here to show you what comes up. Slow, of course. Um, you'll put in your last name and your Iowa eight digit ID number. Now note for last name, this is what Maui thinks you are called. Okay, that's where the last names came from. So if you use a, two names with the space, that's what you would put in. If you use a hyphen with two names, that's what you would put in. So um, once this homework finishes, uh, the one that is homework zero, which will be for extra credit due next week, um, if you want to change the name to something different, I can do that for you. But the idea as noted on the syllabus, so for next week, uh, the week after it's due actually so next week is when I would like you to try and work on it just for you to get familiar with the system you get three points of extra credit off right off the bat for doing it so that way I can check to make sure that you know what you're doing um, the reason that that is relevant one of the things that I didn't get a chance to mention last time about homework is that I'm trying to walk the line this semester between accountability and being flexible and understanding so in previous semesters, I had a policy where late homeworks were deducted three points off your grade to encourage people to actually keep up with the work. Um, when the world ended mid-March last year, I, I shut that off to have no late points because folks were doing all kinds of different things to cope. And I ran into problems of folks putting it off too long um, which is what I had hoped to avoid. Um, I know that you guys have a lot of things going on, and I also know that work that has hard deadlines gets done. Things with soft deadlines tend to be pushed. So as a compromise, uh, the strategy that I've adopted this semester is late homework is one point off. So just to give you a little bit of incentive to keep it, uh, to keep up with the material, not put things off too long. But if you do get into a bind, know that by completing this very first uh, homework zero that introduces you to the system, it's like you get three free late homeworks. So that's the, the compromise that I've reached. So um, I will make a video about how to use that. It's pretty self-explanatory, but I just want to hit a few points to make sure that everyone can follow. And I'll let you know when that video is ready. Otherwise, there's nothing new to report. Uh, the same lectures and materials are posted as of last time. We're a few weeks out before I need to post anything new. So any questions on logistics, scheduling, or otherwise? I see a question. Are the homeworks timed? Absolutely not. No. You can take as long as it takes to get it done and you can try as many times as it takes to get it done. Um, the way that it works is that you can submit, you can work on it, submit answers, you hit save, you can come back later and pick up where you left off. So it's not like a one shot, like you have to get this right this second kind of thing. Uh, another question. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, live oh. question and then I'll go back to the chat window. 
Um, sorry, I had to deal with my dogs. Um, where you had the sign in for the homework, what is the ID number under your last name? Is that like your Hawk ID or is that your university ID? It is the eight digit number that goes with your university account. So it should be on your university ID card. Okay. It's not like the letters, like my ID is like Les Hoffman or something. It's not that one. It's an eight digit numeric code. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't have your ID memorized, you will after this semester. One more bonus. Uh, questions. Let's see if we want to use SAS. Do we have to use remote desktop or is there a way to buy a student license to avoid the VPN hassle? Ah, unfortunately, SAS does not have any student licenses that allow you to install SAS on your desktop proper. Um, if you're on campus anyway, I think that some of the machines on campus may have SAS, but I'm not sure which ones. There is also something called SAS University Edition that you can download that's their product and it's meant for this purpose. Unfortunately, it still runs through a virtual machine type interface. And so there's still that initial hassle of having to figure out how to use it. Um, the My university ID, yes, that's what it is. So historically, I've taught this class two times. Um, the process of getting used to using the virtual desktop to get into it was harder than actually doing the statistics. That is what happened. Um, and unfortunately, that is what we're stuck with um, if you don't want to have to purchase software, which I don't want you to have to do. So to try and solve that problem of confusion, um, I'm going to be uploading some videos that walk you through it. And the, the reason for the confusion is that what you have to type to be able to make things work depends on whether or not you're using a Windows operating system or a Mac operating system and where your files are. And so there's enough permutations of what it looks like that it can be confusing. So I've collected enough examples from students that hopefully I can do a better job troubleshooting. And with the videos, um, you can follow along with me and hopefully have fewer problems in learning to do the system. The first assignment that you have to use that system for is not due until week four, I think. Yeah, week five, excuse me. So we have a ways before um, you'll need to actually have that figured out. So does that answer your question on that? If you don't want to deal with the hassle of the virtual desktop, or you anticipate not having great internet access because it does that system is somewhat resource intense, um, you can buy a student license for Stata. That's a six month license and that's $48. Um, those are the options that I know of. If anyone knows of any others or comes across those, please let me know. Okay. Other questions? I had a question. Yes. There you about are. About the homework? Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, is the homework structured in a way, I'm assuming it's cumulative over all the lectures that you have. Um, so our first homework is due week five. It's on all of the content prior to week five. Yes. Um, are the, is it structured such that like I could go in and do like the first lecture homework and then the next week I could do the next one or are they intermingled? Mostly the, the former. Okay. Yes. Um, so in terms of, of the structure, like I will have a, vid a separate video besides just learning how to use the system, um, demonstrating how to run the example that goes with uh, lecture one and example one, and then homework one will be based on that con those set of concepts. The same thing will be homework two is based on example two. Um, but each of the examples is a series of steps, and so the ho there's chunks of the homework that you'll be able to do as we go over it. Um, one promise that I will make to you is that if we get behind schedule, which can happen for whatever reason, um, I will push the dates of the homework to be later so that you never have less than a full week after we've finished covering the last part before you have to turn it in. So you'll always have a full week to um, after everything is completed before you're responsible for having demonstrated that material. Great, thank you. Sure. We have a question. Uh, yes. Wait. So we looked up the data online to see if we could buy the like six month student situation. Uh -huh. um, it says that there's one for six months that's forty eight dollars, but it says it's mid sized data set, and the one that's one hundred and twenty five is full large like for a large data set. Do you know what that means? 
Yes. Um, what they mean by large is like hundreds of thousands of cases. Okay. So the number of rows you're allowed to have, and th th that's cases and the number of columns. Um, in the, the homework that I'm going to give you, it's going to be very small data sets by state as standard, and so you can get away with the cheapest option. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, other questions? All right, then should we hop back into lecture zero? Yeah, by the way, I started counting at zero because there's no homework that goes with it. So I'm trying to keep like lecture example homework all within the same numbering system for this class. Um, what do you remember from last time? So I'm going to ask you this at the beginning of every class, and you may answer with words, gestures, symbols, numbers. What do you remember? I'm I remember eagerly we watching the chat window, too. Okay. I heard univariate data. Yes, univariate means one variable at a time. Who else? I heard someone start to talk. Uh, that was me, the different types of variables, so categorical categorical and numerical and the kind of the subsets that yes. make up those. Yeah, that, uh, that was where we left off, give or take. I'll fast forward to that slide, number 16, uh, <laughs> that I might not cry. <laughs> Correct. Yes. I can't promise that the rest of life won't make you cry, but it is my intention this semester that this class will not be one of the things to make you cry, unless it's from happiness, because you are so pleased with how it turned out. That could happen too. Uh, other answers, samples, variable types, single, conditional, normal outcomes only, sampling terminology. Yes, so about that, uh, two main ways of thinking about samples independent versus dependent. Independent is when each person is viewed as a separate entity and there's no reason why one person would be more like any other person in the data set. Dependent is when there is some kind of relationship because of the way that you've sampled your people. So if you sample people from intact groups, uh, students from classrooms, teachers from schools, patients from hospitals, whatever common experience that they have as a result of their group membership is going is likely to result in correlations among people from the same group. So that's dependent sampling. Um, it's not bad by any stretch, it just requires an extra level of complexity in terms of what you would then do to the data that we don't have time to cover this semester. So I just wanted to give you um, a sense of what to expect. Everything that we will cover this semester, however, is a foundational piece to then adding stuff to it to be able to address dependent data. Um, up, let's see, applied math, not memorizing formulas, correct. Uh, this is not really a stats class. This is a quantitative methods class. And I make that distinction because the reason that you are here is to improve your research skill set. That is what I firmly believe, and that's the way that I've organized this. Um, stats will be useful. Yes, job security. I am being dead serious. Um, one of the hottest trends in employment right now is data scientists. You heard this term before? It's all over my Facebook feed. Online master's programs in data science. Um, that is a fancy way of saying statistics and a little bit of computer programming. So it's an area that is um, very uh, likely to translate into skills that someone will pay you for. So this will help your cause in getting a job someday. Uh, categorical versus quantitative variables and the computer will do the math. Yes, the computer should do the math because even the most careful person is going to screw up an Excel formula, right? You can be, you can be so vigilant and still have it not work. So learning how to let the programs do the math for you is the safest thing to do, and it's also the most reproducible thing you can do. Because you have a list. At the end of each of your assignments, for instance, you will have a file of computer code that is a, a history of what you did. And so like a year from now, you won't have to try and figure out what you did or remember what you did. You can run it and see it all come right back. So it's, it's a really nice thing in that regard. Uh, practice with working memory like a new language. Yes, 
a lot of new vocabulary, not just English vocabulary, or studies as I tend to call it, but also Greek letters and notation that go along with those ideas. It's like learning a new language. So, good, lots of things you guys remember. Excellent. Anything else? Unbounded is very rare. Yes, also true. So uh, let's, let's start with the variable types since that's what we're talking about. There we go. Uh, types of variables. So categorical variables, one main kind. That's where things might be labeled with numbers, but they're not numbers. They're qualitative or categorical. Uh, there's one thing, the other synonyms, grouping variables, factor variables, class variables. There are three main kinds and knowing which kinds you have then guides you to what you would do with that information, how you would best summarize that variable, how you would think about it in the context of being related to other variables. So binary, nominal, ordinal, the three kinds that we talked about before. We started talking about quantitative variables. This is where the numbers are actually numbers. And within that larger category, I think of it as sort of two subcategories, whether the numbers have some kind of natural boundary because of the way they were measured or whether they don't. Most of the time they do, at least in the kinds of social science research that I think you're most likely to see. Um, so a few examples of quantitative variables that have natural boundaries, binomial variables, um, things like rates or percent correct, number correct out of so many, uh, variables where you have to deal with, um, you have to be concerned with potential ceiling or floor effects. Have you heard those terms before? Maybe? A, f a floor effect is when you have a whole bunch of people who got the lowest possible score. A ceiling effect is when you have a whole bunch of people who got the highest possible score. So you can literally visualize a continuum of information and there's like people shoved up against this wall or shoved up against that wall. So when that happens, you have to take extra consideration in terms of the analysis as to what you would then do to make sure that the things that you're predicting about that variable are plausible. Uh, counts have a boundary on the low end you can't have a negative count. You can't smoke negative three cigarettes in a given day, for instance. Um, some counts don't have zeros. So uh, that's an, a, still a boundary because the lowest you can have is one in that case. Um, the other kind of quantitative variable is what's truly continuous and unbounded. So it's non-integer values. You can have decimals and it can theoretically go on in either direction from negative infinity to positive infinity. That's not likely to happen, but nevertheless, that is the kind of variable that the models that we're going to, to uh, be learning about assumes we're going to be predicting. So it has to be plausibly continuous. In reality, there are lots of types of variables that we make this kind of assumption about, that it is continuous even though it's not really, because it's close enough for government work. Uh, question, can interval data be non-integer as well? Um, if it's continuous, you can have non-integers. So it's truly continuous between integers, that's what I mean. Is that what, does that help? Maybe, do you wanna elaborate? Can interval data be non-integer as well? Yes. Yeah. Um... I, yeah, that's what I wanted to know because uh, we have continuous data, which would be non-integer and unbounded, mm -hmm. yes? And then we have before that interval data, which would be bounded, but I, I, I can't tell if it can also be non-integer as well. It could be. Could um, be. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm approaching this from sort of what you're most likely to see in combinations of each other. But for yep. instance, if you had a, a percent correct, mm -hmm. right, that ranges continuously from zero to one, yep. but it is bounded at zero and bounded at one. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. The same thing would happen with proportions, right? Yeah. Percent correct rates, because you have number correct, you have so many correct out of however many possible to handle differences between the number possible, you can convert to some sort of a rate or a percent. It's, I think of it as the same thing. It would just be on a different scale, whether it's the sum or a mean. 
in that case. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So continue ish is sort of what we end up with a lot of the time. Um, there's one category of variables that you may come across that's literally people call it ordinal treated as interval. This is very, very common. So if you have a scale, say measuring someone's attitude towards something or someone's proficiency for something, and each item on the scale is ordinal, you have four categories that you can say something like, uh, you know, strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, something like that. No one would say that one of those items is anything but ordinal, right? You could give those labels one, two, three, four, but they're not really numbers, right? They're just ordered categories. Well, if you have 10 items, each measured on that same four point scale, and you create a sum across those 10 items, somehow magically it's treated as an interval variable. It just is, that's really common. Um, people call those scale scores. If there's more than one type of score that's being created at the same time, people call those subscores or subscales. That's a very common type of variable that you will see in social science research. And people treat it as if it's a quantitative variable that's actually continuous, even though it's kind of not really. So I call that continue-ish. But the numbers at that point are supposed to be more like numbers than not. You kind of have to believe it's not really true, but people treat it that way. And so that's the same whether you're talking about the sum across items or the mean. Um, it's the same problem. Uh, you may also see variables that are interval and theoretically continuous, but not really because of the way they're measured. So things like response time, um, how quickly someone can respond to a particular task or answer a question is limited only by the precision with which it's measured. And if you're from the world of, say, cognitive psychology, like I used to be, people measure within millisecond precision. And you can have analyses where this type of item was responded to five milliseconds faster than this type of item, and that somehow means something. Well, response time is still bounded at zero. But in most types of tasks, no one would actually have anything near a zero. So it looks like it's continuous, at least over the range that you've observed. Um, a suicidality scale would be that. Yeah, probably. Any kind of scale where people are responding to items that have ordinal measurement and you sum those items or take a mean, that's ordinal treated as interval. Yep. Um, heart rate is another example. Um, things like income or uh, prices, like housing prices, those things are theoretically bounded at zero, but in the actual data, you may not have any cases that are anywhere near zero, so it looks like it's plausibly continuous. So categorical items in one pile, quantitative items in another pile, some of those quantitative items may have boundaries to them. That's sort of the big picture. All right, uh, one last one that you will probably never see is ratio. So things like weight and temperature and stuff like that has a ratio measurement. Um, we don't ever have those kinds of variables for the most part. So you can just lump that into the quantitative section from before. All right, so these variables that I'm talking about are going to show up in data sets, like in your homework or in your research. And the first thing that you'll have to be able to do is figure out how to get the data that you have into a stats program that you want to work with. And so I just have a few slides here about that process because I have found out the hard way that people don't get a lot of training on how to enter data or set up data sets. And it's one of those things where if you start down the wrong path, you can end up with a lot more work having to undo what you did to be able to actually use the data. So there's three steps, basically, that you will have to follow to do homework in this class and to be able to do any kind of quantitative methods on data that you care about. Um, you have your data set saved to a folder someplace. Now that can be on your physical drive or it can be on a server somewhere. But you have to figure out where that is and then convey that information to the program. And that process can be tricky when you're dealing with virtual machines where you're not sure exactly where things are or different server locations or different letter drives that switch across operating systems and that kind of stuff. So that can be a little bit tricky. Um, the program then will import the data in, the, in your original format into a format that it recognizes and then can do something with. 
programs differ widely in how flexible they are with respect to what kind of data they will take. Stata takes relatively fewer types of data as input than say SAS does or even SPSS. I think the newer versions of Stata have gotten more flexible, but historically you had to buy a separate package to convert the files back and forth. Um, R, I'm sure you can look up different routines for importing all different kinds of data. Um, the kind of data that I'm gonna give you is just an Excel spreadsheet. So a .xlsx extension that way you can open it and look at it and see what it looks like without having to log into the virtual machine or have any of these programs on your desktop. So I will make some videos on how to get through this process without pulling your hair out or crying. That's the goal. Um, for each variable that is saved in a data set, typically data sets are structured so that each person is a row, a case as it's called, and the variables are in separate columns. So each column that I'm going to give you is going to have at least two pieces of information for it and possibly three. This is information that I will give you up front. The most critical, the variable's name. So that's the column name. In statistical software programs, names cannot have spaces. Names cannot start with numbers. Names cannot have special characters other than underscore most of the time. So when you're thinking about um, setting up a data set, like if you're entering data to start with, creating column names that follow those conventions will save you time down the road. In order to tell the program to do something with that variable, so if I have, say, looking at the last comment here, a variable called the suicidality scale, I have to know internally what the name of that column is so that I can tell it, hey, go find the mean of the suicidality scale or go use this variable in an analysis. So the names you have to be able to uh, refer to immediately in the code that you write. But because you don't wanna have to spend all of your time typing, names tend to be short. For good documentation purposes, you also want to have what's known as a variable label. That is a longer title that you can attach to the column. That can be, I think, in up to 256 characters, for instance, in SAS. It can have spaces, special characters, it can have anything you want. So you might have like the suicidality scale would be a variable that's called like SUC underscore SCL, something like that, right? It's a, like a little abbreviation. But six months from now, you might not remember what that means, or if you hand the data set to someone else, they won't know what that means. And so along with that, you would have information that you input that says suicidality scale means, and then the longer label that gives more information about where it came from, how it was created, and that kind of stuff. So when you open up your homework, at the top of the file, I will, be, I will have code that lists the names and lists the labels that go with them. And once you execute that code, when you get your printout, the names and the labels will show up. So it makes it easier to read what you're looking for. The third thing that you will have if your variable is categorical is what's known as a value label. And this is a system of labels that tell you what the numbers mean. So if I have an ordinal item, for instance, and I have the numbers one, two, three, four, what does that mean? I don't want to have to remember what 1, 2, 3, 4 means if it's an arbitrary set of assignments. So you can tell it up front, no, 1 means strongly agree, 2 means agree, 3 means disagree, 4 means strongly disagree. Then if you attach that information to your column by executing the code, that shows up on all of your printouts. So you don't have to remember what 1, 2, 3, 4 means. So I will give you all three of these things at the start of each homework so that you know the information that you're dealing with. Okay. Okay? All right. So entering data. Um, no matter what package you, you plan to analyze your data in, starting it out with a spreadsheet is fine. Entering data into Excel is fine. I love freeze panes and split rows and all the things that you can do to like make it easier to see multiple things at once. Don't think that just because you're going to use Stata or SAS down the road that you have to start there. 
it's perfectly fine to start with the spreadsheet. That way you can share it across multiple platforms and researchers more easily. Um, when you have your spreadsheet though, if you intend to read that spreadsheet into a stats package and have it recognize the information, put the names that you want your variables to be called in the first row. Only the first row. It will only read the first row. There is an option that you can say, take the first row and treat it as names rather than data. So if you know that you're going to do this, choosing names that it can read easily is your best bet. That means no spaces, no special characters other than underscore. Do not start with a number and keep it short. Um, it used to be back in the day that all variable names had to be eight characters or less. Um, nowadays, you can have more characters, but keep in mind that the longer your name, the longer it is to type it every single time you want to refer to it. So not so long that you annoy yourself, not so short that you don't know what you're talking about later on. Somewhere in between is a good name. Um, let's see, a common stem will help you. So when you have to do the same thing to a series of variables, for instance, if I have a bunch of test items, item one, item two, item three, and I eventually want to compute a sum across those items, say the number correct, rather than using names that convey what's in the item, just say item one, item two, item three, because you can use abbreviations in the code that say like item one dash item 100, and it will understand that what you mean is item one, item two, item three, item four, item five, without having to type it all. Uh, question, does SAS and Stata predict what you are typing? Uh, yes, Stata can do that. SAS can do that in Enterprise, which is an interface that I typically don't use, but that is available, yes. So it does do the, the complete thing. Each of them also has a, drop, has a series of drop-down menus. So you can navigate your way to various commands. Um, I tend to find that annoying because I, I, I can usually find an example of what I need to do that just has the code and I can change the code. Um, but yeah, there are various ways to help you complete each of these things from the documentation without having to memorize all the commands. So yeah, so yeah, um, saving yourself some steps and how you name things, you will think yourself down the road. Um, other things that I've seen people do, you know, the way that you would Format a spreadsheet so that it looks nice and it's easy to read, um, maybe to put it in a presentation or something like that. Like I've seen people do things like, well, the cells that are colored red mean this and the cells that are colored blue mean that. SAS doesn't read colors, neither does data. It has no way of knowing what the formatting is. So any of the conditional formatting types of things that you might do to make it look nice is you're going to have to undo it. So if you need to say that cells in red mean this and cells in blue mean that, you need another column that says whether a given observation should be red or blue. And that variable would be like one if it's red and two if it's blue, something like that. Um, also, if you want to divide your spreadsheet into sections, those sections are going to have to be undone once you read the data in. So there's no way to say, you know, here's the names of the columns for these 10 cases and now I'm going to switch the names for the next 10 and nope nope it's only one row. If you're in a situation where you have multiple tables like at some point the names need to change put that in a different sheet. Make that a separate data set that way it can be imported separately and you can then merge them together as needed later on. Okay questions? All right then other stuff. Okay, categorical variables. I'm going to beg you never to treat them as actual text. This is a really, really common thing that I see. So if you have something like you're asking for gender identity and you have options like female, male, you know, non-binary, whatever you have, it's tempting to type in the word female, male, etc. But keep in mind that variables that are text, they're known as string variables, are case and space sensitive. So if you type female with a capital F one time, that is not the same as female with a lowercase f. If you accidentally put a space before it or a space after it, it's not the same. And you would be surprised, or maybe you're not surprised, at the infinite number of typos 
of patterns of typos that people can type in that you then have to go through and undo. <laughs> Don't do that to yourself. Come up with some sort of numerical system where one means this, two means this, and have people enter the numbers. Because you can always convert the numbers to labels later, right? You can use va value labels to tell the program, no, one means female, and two means male, and three means this. You don't have to type the words. So try to stay away from string variables unless they're things like open-ended responses where they're comments and they really there's no way to categorize them and you just need to preserve the original text. That's the only type of thing. Or last names, for instance. Those are string variables that you kind of can't get away from. Um, within the variable labels, so for instance, if I have a variable called group and I have zero values and one values, and I want zero to be the control group and one to be the alternative group, meaning whatever's being treated. Different packages will sometimes use the order that the numbers go in. Other packages like SAS, I found this out the hard way, will switch it to be alphabetical. So if I want zero to be the control group and one to be the alternative group, and I read in those variable labels, it will switch it so that alternative is always listed first and control is listed second because that's how it is alphabetically. That will make you annoyed because you have an ordering system that's already in your mind and switching it to be alphabetical or something else is going to, bot is going to be harder to make it to understand the information. So when you see the variable labels that I give you or the value labels, excuse me, I put the number in. So even though it's kind of redundant, you will see zero is the control group and one is the alternative group. That way it's always in the same order that I wanted it to be. Um, if you have a column in your Excel spreadsheet or wherever you're entering data, where for instance, someone writes don't know or wouldn't respond and you type that in, the entire column becomes string, becomes a text variable or a string variable. So then all the numbers in that column are going to be created, treated as text. So don't do that. If you're in a situation where you have one variable and sometimes it's numbers and sometimes it's text, make it two. So if somebody didn't give you a number, leave it blank. And then in a separate column, you can have something like reasons it was blank. And one can mean didn't answer, two could mean, uh, you know, refuse to answer, three could mean wasn't administered, something like that. Um, missing data, leave it blank. You will see folks go to the trouble to fill in missing values manually. Um, oftentimes you'll see negative numbers used to indicate missing values, like minus 99 is a classic one, minus 999 sometimes if you wanna go overboard. That's because negative numbers that large are unlikely to be real values but you are wasting your effort if you type all of those in. Because with just a few lines of code, you can say, oh, by the way, anything that's blank is missing. And you don't have to do all of that typing. Um, also, if you forget to tell it that minus 99 is missing, it will treat it as if it's a real number and it will screw everything up. So if you have missing data, just leave it, leave it missing. It will be fine. Um, dependent data, last piece here. If you have a research project that involves collecting information about different levels of analysis. So let's say that you're studying student performance across different classrooms, across schools, um, different schools from the same district, right? That's a type of project that you might come across. That's dependent data. I would call that a three level analysis because you have students nested in schools or classrooms nested within schools. So you may have information about the schools, right? Their annual enrollments, the number of teachers, um, the percentage of children who get free lunch, you know, school level information. That should be one data set, one spreadsheet. You may have information about the classrooms, the number of kids in the class, the years of experience of the teacher, whatever. That's another data set. And then for each kid, you have their ID number, their age, their background, etc. That's a third data set. So don't think that you can only have one data set because that's where you get into trouble in terms of either having extra typing or things that don't match. Have separate data sets for each level of analysis. You can merge them all together properly within the software 
as needed. So you don't have to like type things that are redundant. Because if you try to do that, what's going to happen? Let's say that you think about, well, I have this project, we're measuring students. So I have my students in different rows. Well, these students are all in Mrs. Smith's class. So I have to type Mrs. Smith all these times. And then I have to type Mrs. Smith's years of experience all these times. And I have to repeat that. So you'd have to enter the same number over and over again because it pertains to a higher level of sampling. If you have separate data sets, you don't have to do that. And then you can merge everything cleanly together so long as you have ID numbers. ID numbers are the thing that's going to save you in that case. Each student gets an ID number, each classroom gets an ID number, and each school gets an ID number, and then you can merge across as needed. Uh, okay, so that's the end of that story. Questions on anything so far? Okay, I will make a promise to you. If you are ever in a situation where you are staring down an Excel spreadsheet and you see that you're going to have to do the same thing to it over and over and over again, but like change one thing each time, stop and send me an email. Because there's got to be a way to do it faster in a program, and I've probably found it before because I've done something the wrong, the long and stupid way, and I've found out the hard way. My second year of graduate school, um, I was working on, should we get Excel for this class too? You don't have to have Excel. I'm just using that as an example. Um, Google Spreadsheets, what, are, what do you call it? Open Office, uh, anything that works with spreadsheets would be fine for that. But true story. My second year of graduate school, I was working on my master's thesis, and I had to get summary information for each person in the data set across a bunch of different variables. And I didn't know how to do that. So what I ended up doing is like just cutting down the data set to one person, generating the information, taking that information and typing it in another data set, and then doing that for every single person. That was like six weeks of work. Come to find out that is three lines of code to have that generated for me. I had a student um, that I was helping with her dissertation who spent her entire summer summarizing across rows of cases in Excel to generate a, a new value and entering that value into a different spreadsheet her whole summer. And that was three lines of code to get it to do that. So don't, don't do that to yourself. Uh, learning data management inside these programs can save you a ton of work. And it can also make it so that it's a more reliable result because even as careful as you are, if you're taking information and manually entering it into a different place, that's where error comes from. So I'm happy to help. Uh, yes, you have earned the right to email me for the rest of your lives with such questions. That's, that's, your, that's your right that you've earned for being in this class. The only thing that I ask is that you pay it forward because someday someone will come to you with questions and then you owe them an answer to. Okay, any other questions about data introductions to variable types and that kind of thing? Yes or no? Farhan, you waved at me. I'm like, go on. Okay, I'll shut this one down and then I have the second 